Hey guys, D Mike here for another episode of Super Nintendo Sundays. Some more Do Re Mi. Pretty appropriate now that we're doing a little bit of a musical inclined part of the game. But first, a tutorial, of course. This construction vest wearing mouse is going to tell us that uh, we can climb curtains, which is great. Great news, because we, you know, we wouldn't have been able to figure this out just by trying it, I guess. But this part is actually kind of useful. So there's these green spades that are on top of certain doors and they're supposed to lead you the right way. But it's a little misleading because the game itself is not actually being completely honest here. You would think it was referring specifically to that green spade mark. It's not. And you'll see what I mean in a little bit. So time to explore the concert hall. These these levels are weird, but hey, at the very least, this one has some nice music in it. Wouldn't expect anything less from the musical part of the game. Feels kind of whimsical. Seems kind of like a maybe like a Christmassy type of a song. We'll be constantly accosted by floating sheet music. And I think these things are supposed to be like little castanets, maybe? Or like finger symbols or something? I don't know. But I do enjoy... I do enjoy the music of this one, and... You can sort of hear it in between me blabbering. Is when you push that brick, it lines up with the cadence of the, of the song. So I think that's kind of a nice little touch. I'm assuming that was intentional. It follows the same beat, so... There's that. But yeah, once again, this game never ceases to stop amazing me and is always so impressive with how random everything is. I don't know if I'm just, you know, just a stupid American or what, but this game is very strange and I love it. I think I, I, I like it a lot for that reason. It's just kind of goofy, and I don't think that it tries to take itself too seriously. But I'm also not entirely sure, like when they made this game, how much time was spent kind of polishing it. There are some parts of this game that I'm just like, how did you come to developing it like this? Also, these pillars, speaking of gameplay, are obnoxious. There are plenty moments that you'll notice that the game uses them as a foreground object and they'll hide things behind it, which is kind of a nice touch in terms of gameplay. It's also a turd touch because don't touch turds, but it is a little annoying that they do that. Also, I think these stars, like the gold ones with the music notes, I think that those are what you're supposed to collect as kind of the, the keys to beating the world you're in. And see, there you go. I have a little Mouseketeer there. Hiding back behind the pillar. And here you go, we've beat the level, that's it. That wasn't too bad, right? Oh wait, just kidding. Didn't find the green spade, therefore, level not complete. So. I love that. It's a nice touch. And I mean, this is just an excuse to hear this great song again, right? Who wouldn't want to have the opportunity to have this bless your ears? I do like it a lot. I would say the music in this game is... When it's good, it's really good. And when it's bad, it's really bad. So... You'll see what I mean in a few moments. This stage in particular. Whimsical. Cheery. Fun. The stage after this one? Well, you'll see. But enjoy this while you can the one and a half times that I'm playing through this level. And see, there you go. There's the green marker that shows you the end of the level. But for those of you that are potentially keen on card playing, that's not a spade. The old shamrock, the club. But that's what it is. That's what you needed to find. You just need to find a green mark. 
above a door. Now, what does that have to do with music? I, I don't know. And that's one of the things that I think about when I'm playing through this game is like, you know, why, why are there bowling balls? Why are, why am I being attacked by coconuts on a xylophone? I don't know. Actually, it's probably more of a marimba, but it's just, I don't know why they put the things into this game that they did. Some of it makes sense, like aesthetically. There's a little bit of continuity with the sheet music and the symbols and the, you know, the castanets. That all makes sense. But then they also have stuff like this, where there's a mini game where you're trying to do a, a rip off of Duck Hunt and shoot some birds. I just, I don't get it. And I think it's just because I'm, I'm just, this game is too, it's above me, you know, intellectually. Do Re Mi was actually made with participants of Mensa in mind. So it's just my small brain just can't comprehend the magnitude of what this game is trying to achieve. That's that's honestly it. So, you know, maybe if I would have spent more time paying attention in school, getting some book learning in, I would be able to understand what this game is all about. The deep, high level, elevated meeting. Meaning, I need to have a meeting. So yeah, apparently, that's good. It says game over like you lost. I don't... And maybe this is because it's like a translation thing. That was a pro move. Not letting that, uh... That mouse trying to kill me, but... We only got one of these bad boys with that bowling ball. Why bowling balls? Why are we blowing bubbles? Why do we look like an elf? Why is our name Mulan? I don't know. So here we go. This level is weird. It is fun. Like this level is really challenging compared to some of the others. You're hopping across these kind of bells, some of which will give you safe passage, others will not. So hopefully you picked up that bubble gum from the last stage. There are a lot of pits in this one, so it'll definitely help you out. And those little kind of golden Oreos right there, you can only land on them briefly. So yeah, there's just this weird occasional piano sting. Some bells in the background. I don't know. And then this weird, like, synthesizer riff, which kind of sounds like... A symbol roll? I don't know. This entire stage is very weird. And when I go and I edit these videos, I like to try to find music from the game. Music that's enjoyable, like the invincibility theme for Morgan here, you know? All these types of things that make a good game. A good soundtrack. And this almost feels like maybe some of the soundtrack, they hired an actual composer, and then maybe they found the 90s version of Fiber, and they just were like, or and there's like some sort of an intern, like, okay, how about you make us a song? So there we go, Bubblegum bailing me out. But yeah, how about you make us a song? How about you, you compose us a masterpiece, which is just random bells and... Kind of eerie sounds. I don't know. I don't know. Like listening to it in headphones is even worse because it's kind of like it just sounds very creepy. And like this, you know, imagery in the background looks kind of like maybe like stained glass windows of like a church or something like that. Does that aesthetically line up to you viewers as an environment that would make sense to have us die twice in 30 seconds? Or does it make sense to have this music in the background? Like, I feel like this would be kind of more of a cheery environment unless maybe the people who made this game have bad experiences with churches. I don't know. I'm not going to speak for them. I just think that this area is kind of weird. Which is a shame because this level in particular is kind of tough. And it actually does feel like they put a good amount of effort into it. Like the mechanic of the bells and... You know, you having to really time jumps. Because this is a pretty tough platformer. 
I like that. I like that they put a lot of effort into this in particular because it's kind of tough and fun. Especially grabbing that bubble gum. It'll save your buns, I promise. Like, that kind of stuff is silly and it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. But, like, I don't know. That. I guess I can suspend my belief a little bit more than some of these other things. I don't know. Definitely thinking way too hard about a game that's, at this point, like th almost 30 years old. But a game that never really reached American markets. Actually, I don't think it reached American markets at all. So what you're seeing is content from a faraway land curated just for you. At DMike Industries, we like to bring a different perspective in life. Show you some things that maybe you wouldn't normally see in your daily life. Some games that might have slipped under the radar. That, for all intents and purposes, make me feel like I'm experiencing a fever dream. So, there's that. I will never get tired of... Myron's bubble blasting powers to the face that he makes when he gets all, all chuffed. His chubby cheeks are very cute. But yeah, there's the second star power. And that's part of it, like these older games. I was thinking about this the other day. When I'm playing through some games, and some of them, especially older ones, they do a really good job of surrounding the player with content that is supposed to guide you towards the goal. Now, I don't mean make you successful, but they're supposed to essentially give you the tools that you as the player should be able to figure out based on your surroundings, based on potentially maybe a little exposition, whatnot. This game kind of does that. There's still plenty of parts of it that maybe if I understood Japanese, like maybe the original Japanese translation is, or I guess I should say, you know, Japanese content in the game. Maybe it makes sense. Maybe, maybe the original people who would play this like, oh, this is what this is and this is totally understandable. But, you know, I don't know Japanese. And so I'm just relying on the faithful servants who went ahead and translated this for all of us here in the West. And I'm, I'm trying to kind of put the pieces together. Now, thank goodness for flying shoes because this is my favorite power up in the game as somebody who is incredibly cautious especially when playing this one because of how brutal it can be having the floaty shoes is definitely a uh, a saving grace we'll say that so hopefully you enjoy watching these big balls bounce around as much as I do but some games I've noticed is there's definitely a trend and I don't know kind of when this happened I you know I'm not a gaming historian so I don't have some sort of deep invested knowledge of the trends within video games but I think it is interesting and just based on my perspective is it seems like games now are trying to pander a little bit to holding the hand of the gamer a little bit which is a little disappointing some of them don't I'm not trying to make a sweeping statement here but some of them some of them do I've noticed especially with like remakes of games I mean for instance you guys have been hopefully watching and enjoying subscribing commenting liking etc the Pokemon Diamond Let's Play and that's a game that as we bonk our head losing the two brain cells we had that's a game that the original for the DS didn't have quite as many quality of life things but the game also kind of holds your hand a little bit. It does make it a little bit easier because of the experience, all the experience share, etc. So, you know, there's that. So we did not solve this level once again. We did not get to the green mark. I'm not sure why they chose that and why they chose things from card games or whatever. But the... The floaty shoes will save us again. Um, but yeah, like going back to that point, it's weird for me that games in certain cases will 
absurdly hold your hand. Like there's, it's a little, it, they're making it a little bit too easy, especially on games that they themselves, I feel like aren't terribly difficult. Like for instance, Pokemon games, I feel like those games by and large, by their nature, aren't terribly difficult. You know, I know the games are essentially made for children, so they can't be too brutal or else kids aren't going to want to play them and whatnot. But, you know, I feel like there are, there are suitable levels of difficulty in those games that it doesn't make me, you know, rage quit. That's a deep cut for you from a few years ago. I don't feel that way. But, yeah, there's just some games where it feels like there's a, they're tutorialized a little too much, and I don't know if that necessarily... It's not a horrible thing, but I do find myself a little kind of worn out by that. But then there's also the opposite side of things, which still does occur with certain games now. So I'm not trying to like say like all games hold your hand. But there's some games that I've played, indie games maybe in particular, where the level of difficulty is kind of artificial because they don't share with what with the with the game player what you're supposed to do. You're just kind of figuring it out as you go, which is kind of good, but there has to kind of be that happy median, or is it medium? I don't know. But there has to be that happy sweet spot where when you play a game, you're given enough information to be able to make elevated decisions based on your surroundings, based on the resources you have. And then from that, you gain knowledge over time, you gain skills over time, you know, the viewer, gamer, whatever you want to call yourself, player, player, um, that person grows with the content. And I feel like that's what makes a good game over a not so good game, is that you have to develop that muscle memory, but the game also has to help you develop that muscle memory. You know, you're not just going to intrinsically know how to do it unless you're, I don't know, like that kid from the the wizard movie, I don't know. But that's what I think about, like certain games where I feel like the game does a good job of including what you're supposed to do. And then some games they don't, like this one, this one is just kind of like you figure it out as you go. Like, yeah, of course, common sense would say you're supposed to jump on a timpani because it's going to launch you into the sky. But there are certain moments where I'm just kind of like scratching my head, like, why did they put this in here? And once again, it could entirely just be a misunderstanding on my part. I have no clue what I'm seeing. You know, maybe to the average mid 90s Japanese game player, they were like, oh yeah, this is easy peasy. And you're just some fool, you being me. I don't know, I couldn't tell you, but I still think that this game gives you mostly enough of what you're supposed to do. There's those little tutorial sections, which I feel like are good because without them, there's certain things that you wouldn't know how to do, but then also part of it, it's like, why did you tell me this? Climbing on curtains, pushing blocks. That's something you could literally figure out with five seconds of trial and error. So I'm not sure why they thought that was the good way to handle it. Not the worst way, you know, they're not gonna go full RPG on you and hit you with a half an hour of exposition before you can start playing a game. But, you know, there's gotta be a, uh, a certain, a certain middle ground of how you handle it. Now, going back to gameplay, specifically right here, these little arrow blocks makes me think back to the World 7 of Mario 3 with the pipe world, and there's a couple of those levels where you have to hop on the little switches, and they'll carry you around. Recently just beat Mario 3, and that felt great, so congrats to me. Doing great, but hey, that's the end of Dory Me for now. I'll stop complaining. Thanks for watching, everybody. This has been Super Nintendo Sundays. I've been D-Mike, and I'll see you next time. Bye.